Welcome to lecture four of the test design series. Of all the black box techniques, I think scenario testing is the hardest to teach and the hardest to learn in a classroom setting. It's easy to create individual scenarios. It's much harder to imagine how to create well-designed collections of scenarios. Learning scenario testing involves both understanding what a scenario is and understanding how to create a set of related scenario tests that give you insight together into some aspects of the quality of the product. After I complete today's overview of scenario testing, I'll present more ideas for comparing, contrasting, and selecting between test techniques. There are three required readings on scenarios and one on design. Scenario-based testing is hard because it requires you to know a lot about the product and to understand what you know well enough to be able to apply it to significant tests. It's much easier for novices to work with scenarios little brother, the use case. So let me present use cases and use case based testing first and then we'll work up to scenarios. A use case includes a sequence of actions that are performed by the system that yield a result that's of value to an actor. Notice your focus is on the actions of the system, not on the user. An actor does things in order to achieve a goal. Things would be simpler if we knew the actor was always human because then we could talk about what the actor wants. But in use cases the actor might be another program. So it can have a goal, it can have an objective, but it can't have feelings. Think about creating a presentation using OpenOffice Impress or PowerPoint. One goal is to create the entire presentation, but you can also think of creating each slide as a goal. So if there are 100 slides, you could think of this as 100 goals. If the slides are different enough, this might be 100 interestingly different use cases. Importing a picture is a goal too. So you can organize this into a hierarchy. Importing a picture is a sub-goal of creating a slide, which is a sub-goal of creating the entire presentation. For each goal or sub-goal, you can think in terms of a sequence of actions needed to achieve that goal. In the unified modeling language, we use sequence diagrams to show the sequence of actions involved in a use case. Alistair Coburn's book presents an excellent set of guidelines for writing use cases. He gives lots of examples. He presents a detailed process for creating a full set of use cases for a program. I've shortened and simplified his summary description here. Now in Coburn's terms, creating the presentation is a summary goal. Creating the slides, sub-goals. Importing the picture, sub-sub-goal. Now imagine creating a test for importing pictures into slides. To do this, you have to decide on a specific slide and a place on the slide where you're going to put the picture and it's a specific picture that's located, its files located in a specific place on the disk. Filling in the specifics to get from a test idea to the actual test is called instantiating the use case. In the terminology of the Rational Unified Framework, an instantiated use case is a scenario. And if you test the scenario, you've run a scenario test. Now I prefer to call these use case based tests because they don't map well to what I think of as scenarios. There are lots of benefits of use case based testing. Studying a system this way takes the tester beyond individual features or individual spec claims. Instead, you look at meaningful sequences. You ask what people want to do with the system and what steps, what combination of functions, in what order they have to execute to achieve those goals. The use case also contains its own oracle. If a sequence that should lead to the achievement of a goal doesn't actually achieve the goal, the program is broken. And if the sequence shouldn't reach the goal, if it should go to error handling instead but it doesn't, or if the error isn't handled well, that's a reportable failure too. In a computer science course with undergraduates who have no professional development or testing experience, use case-based testing is a strong starting point for teaching students about evaluating programs as systems that people use to achieve goals. In terms of what most undergraduates can learn and do in a survey course, Use case based testing is much easier to teach than scenario testing. But the use case strips the human element out of the story. Why do people want to do things in this story? How important is the goal to the person who's trying to achieve it? What's the consequence if the program fails and blocks her from her goal? Will she be upset? Why? Can she work around the failure or is it a complete block? Understanding the human element might be irrelevant for behavior diagrams, but it's invaluable for prioritizing tests, combining goals in human meaningful ways, and interpreting and explaining results. John Carroll and his colleagues have discussed this distinction in detail. A story doesn't have to be about humans. 
There are lots of stories in literature about non-humans. You'll create scenarios without people, but most stories are about people, and those people add human interest. When I think of scenarios, I think of hypothetical stories that people use to think through complex problems or systems. Scenario-based thinking became popular in military planning, especially in the 1950s. Then it gained widespread commercial popularity after an enormous success at Royal Dutch Shell. Shell had used scenarios to imagine potential future crises. In the 1970s, the world was hit with an unexpected oil crisis. Shell was ready for it. Nobody else was. Kahn's list of benefits of scenarios is pretty representative of what I've learned about scenarios in several different fields. Scenarios help you imagine complexity and work with it. They help you imagine the complexity of people and society and how those interact with technology. This is completely missing from simple sequence diagrams that testers trace through when they work with use cases. Use cases have value, but they're not scenarios. So let me bring this back to testing with an example. The example has real roots, but I've changed some of the details. Once upon a time, a company was developing a desktop publishing program, and they found a little bug. If you tried to paste a graphic about the size of a postage stamp into the upper left corner of a document, it bounced. It would move away from the edge of the document. You could paste it nearby, but not in the corner. Unfortunately, the relevant code was fragile. The programmers were afraid to touch it. So they argued that the user could easily work around the bug. All they had to do was resize the graphic or put it somewhere else. I was the project manager. I accepted the argument and I deferred the bug. The lead tester argued this was unreasonable. After all, this was a desktop publishing program. Precise placement of graphics and text is exactly what these programs do. So I reminded the tester that this was a cheap little desktop publisher. This was a time when typical desktop publishing programs sold for 500 bucks. Ours sold for less than 100. We designed it for priests and school teachers, self-employed people who were trying to market themselves on the cheap. They were getting a really great buy. So a little workaround shouldn't bother them. So the test lead found someone that it did bother. He found a woman who helped her children lay out their Girl Scout newsletter. They were still printing these on hand crank mimeograph machines. The idea of printing by computer was delightful but the newsletter's Girl Scout logo was in the upper left corner. Mom wanted to format it the same as before. She didn't want to move the logo, but we couldn't put the logo there. So the test lead had found a real life customer who fit the target profile for our product, and she was grumpy about the postage stamp bug. This had just gone from a use case, place the graphic in a corner, to a scenario. The difference is that it was no longer a simple check of the capability of the program. Now it was a story about someone who wanted the program to do something, why she wanted to do it, and how it was supposed to respond to her needs. I was impressed. This was a nice little scenario, but I wasn't going to fix the bug. The programmers had warned me this part of the program was fragile. I believed them. Fixing a little bug can open the door to much more serious bugs. I wasn't ready to take that risk. Mom can just move the logo. Well, our testers weren't satisfied with this. So they wrapped the bug inside another scenario. This time they thought about a program called PageMaker. PageMaker was a high-end desktop publishing program, but it inspired the design of many parts of our program. In fact, we had a marketing manager who would say that anything that PageMaker could do, our program could do cheaper. So the testers got themselves some books of PageMaker templates. These presented professionally designed newsletters that you could create in PageMaker. Anything PageMaker can do, we can do cheaper, right? So these were great in testing. They were fair tests, but they were very challenging. So we could look to see if our program had usability problems or any other kind of reliability problems when you were trying to do something that was real life, but a lot more challenging than a simple test. Of course, the very first PageMaker template they tested had a graphic you know where. But this time, Instead of dealing with an end user who had absolutely no influence with the programmers, they hooked this bug to the marketing manager. Anything PageMaker can do, we can do cheaper. We fixed the bug the next week.